Good evening. Let's all stand. I will worship. With all of my heart, with all of my heart, and I will praise you. I will praise you with all of my strength. All my strength, I will seek you. I will seek you all of my days. All of my days, and I will follow. I will follow. All of your ways, all your ways, and I will, I will give you all my worship. I will give you all my praise. You alone, I long to worship. You alone are worthy of my praise. I will bow down I will bow down and tell you as king tell you as king and I will serve you I will serve give you give you everything give you everything I will lift up I will lift up my eyes to your throne my eyes to your throne and I will trust you. I will trust you. I will trust you alone. Trust in you alone. And I, I will give you all my worship. I will give you all my praise. You alone I long to worship. You alone are worthy of my praise. I will give you all my worship and I will give you all my praise you alone I long to worship you alone are worthy of my praise you are this evening you know Lord again we just I know I do Father count it such a privilege and such an honor this evening to be able to gather in the midweek with the body of Christ and just worship you, Father. Open your word and study it, Lord. And so, Father, as we begin our service this evening, we would ask that you would just fill this place with your presence. That, Father, you would just wrap your loving arms around each and every one of us that have made that commitment to come out this evening. That you would strengthen us, that you would encourage us that you'd speak deep and permanent things into our lives for having been here, Lord. So, Father, we just give you this time. We open our hearts. We open our minds. Father, we're going to open your word. We want to lift our hands and surrender and raise our voices in praise this evening because you are worthy. You always have been. You always will be. And so we thank you for these things this evening in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's kids that say, Amen. Hey, let's remain standing. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful. With streams of abundance flow, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, the walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. 
blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing, every blessing you pour out on, turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Blessed be your name. You give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will choose to say, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say. Blessed be your name. Lord, help us, God, that that would be the case, Lord. Lord, that we would be in such a, a spot in our relationship with you. Lord, whether we're on the hilltop or in the valley, Lord, that we would say, blessed be your name. We thank you, Lord, that your yoke is easy and your burden is light, Lord. And you want us to come to you, casting our cares, God, at your feet. So, Lord, I pray for just those of us, Lord, that are heavy burdened, Lord, that we would be able to cast our cares, Lord, at your feet and worship you. To give back to you praise and honor and glory that's due your name. We praise you, Jesus. You may be seated. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. I wait for the Lord. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. I wait for the Lord. In His word I place my trust. 
in his word I rest in his word I place my trust for I know I must wait I wait for the Lord my soul waits I wait for the Lord and I wait for the Lord my soul waits I wait for the Lord In His Word I place my trust In His Word I rest In His Word I place my trust For I know I must wait Mansion I live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And I shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. I wait for you, Lord. My soul waits, I wait for you, Lord. I wait for you, Lord. My soul waits, I wait for you, Lord. In your word I place my trust, in your word I rest. In your word I place my trust For I know I must wait In your word I place my trust In your word I rest In your word I place my trust for I know I must wait For the Lord I must wait Yes, I know I must wait Lord, we thank you, God, that we don't have to wait for you, but we do wait on you, God. For you are with us, Lord. But there are some things, God, that you, you do require us to wait for. So, Lord, we rest in you and we wait upon you. Help us, God, to not be anxious for anything, but in prayer and supplication, Lord, that we might find that peace, Lord, that surpasses understanding. You are good, you are good When there's nothing good in me You are love, you are love On display for all to see You are light, you are light When the darkness closes in You are hope, you are hope And I've covered all my sin You are peace you are peace when my fear is crippling you are true you are true even in my wandering you are joy you are joy you're the reason that i sing you are life you are life in you death is lots of steam and oh I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms, the riches of your love will always be enough, nothing compares to your embrace, light of the world, 
forever reign. You are more, you are more, you are more, more than words could ever say. You are Lord, you are Lord, all creation will proclaim. You are here, you are here, in your presence I made whole. You are God, you are God, of all else I'm letting go. Oh. And oh, I run into your arms, I run into your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world forever reign. And oh, I run into your arms, I run into your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world forever reign you are good you are good when there's nothing good in me you are love you are love on display for all to see you are light you are light when the darkness closes in you are hope you are hope you have covered all my sin. Thank you, Jesus. Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul, oh, my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, I worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. You're rich in love and just slow to anger. Your name is great and your thought is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, I worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. And 
on that day when my strength is failing the end draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then forevermore bless the lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his holy name sing like never before oh my soul i worship your holy name bless the lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his holy name sing like never before oh my soul i worship your holy name i worship your holy name Worship your holy name. Praise you, Jesus. When peace like a river untendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say it is well it is well with my soul it is well it is well with my soul with my soul it is well it is well with my soul though satan should buffet though trial should come let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul it is well it is well with my soul with my soul it is well it is well with my soul my sin oh the bliss of this glorious thoughts my sin not in part but the whole is nailed to the cross 
and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. It is well. With my soul, with my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul. Lord, we thank you, God, that you have, Lord, you've forgiven our sin, Lord, for you don't remember it, Father, as far as the east is from the west, Lord. You choose, God. To forget it, no, and Lord, to not hold us against us, Lord. Father, we pray that you would help us, Lord, to, to cling to this, God. Lord, that we would run to you. Lord, that we would run our race, God. And Father, that you would fill us with peace, Lord, and comfort. And Lord, you give us courage. Lord, you give us courage. For you said that you'll never leave us nor forsake us, God. We thank you for this. Let's all stand. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole. Do you believe it, church? Is nailed to the cross, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul is nailed to the cross, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul, it is well, it is well, with my soul, with my soul, it is well, it is well, with my soul. It is well, it is well, with my soul, with my soul, it is well, it is well, with my soul. Yes. You know, Father, this evening, What a wonderful thing to be able to say. What a wonderful thing to be able to know. What a remarkable thing to be able to say. That no matter what comes, no matter if we don't even make it through this evening in some tragedy on the way home, that our life here in this earth was to end. If tonight in our sleep we were to have a heart attack or tomorrow morning, you know, on the way to work, something was to happen, Lord, we can say tonight with all assurance, because of the work of Christ, because of the blood that was shed for our sins, because of the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness, this great salvation that we have in Christ, we can say that no matter what happens, no matter what comes our way, no matter what difficulty, Lord, we have to face, it is well with our soul. And Lord, I, I just thank you that this is as bad as it gets for us. I mean, this is it. And, you know, what's the worst thing that could happen to us? The devil could threaten to snuff us out and send us home? Are you kidding? Lord, we thank you tonight for these precious promises. We are redeemed, we are regenerated, we are washed, we are sanctified, and we are saved. Our names are in the book of life. We're 
We are owned and bought with a precious price by the king of glory. We belong to a king. We're a part of his kingdom. And one of these days, the king is coming. And we get to go home. Lord, we are sojourners and pilgrims in a really strange place. We really don't belong here. And Lord, we just, with anticipation, wait. You know, we sing those songs, Lord, and they stir in me that desire, Lord. And I was just praying today, what is it going to be like? Man, what is it going to be like? And so, Lord, we, we, we purify ourselves because we have this hope in us. And help us to be those people that are ready, that are watching, that are waiting, that haven't fallen asleep that have plenty of oil, whose lamps are trimmed and they are burning bright and clean because you know not the day nor the hour that the Son of Man will come. could be any moment. So may we be ready. And now, Lord, we just want to pray for those that have been calling in this week. A lot of folks are, you know, we've gone through the head cold, the chest cold season, and now we're in the stomach flu. Man, like... You know, I thought of that scripture as I was talking to one gal today and praying for her on the phone that it's like the guy that ran away from the bear and leaned against the wall and got bit by a snake. You know, it's just, what? But Lord, we pray for them tonight that you would heal them and that we thank you that it's only a 24-hour bug and not a, you know, a seven-day thing. And so, Lord, just heal those people and especially as it goes to their whole family with their little children. You know, little children don't know how to cope as, you know, they're projectile vomiting, Lord. We just pray for them today, Lord, that you would just be with them and heal us quickly. And Lord, I pray above all things, I don't get it. And you can keep me from that, I ask in Jesus' name. And all God's kids would say, amen, amen. Greet one another for a few moments before you settle into your place. Can you bump it down a couple degrees, or at least one degree? We can settle in our places this evening. We'll get moving. We got a very interesting study tonight. This one's peculiar. <laughs> in fact, it might even seem a little weird. So, as you're finding your places, let's turn to Genesis chapter 6. We've come that far. And over the next several Wednesday nights as we're moving through Genesis, we want to kind of pick up the pace if we can. I know that's all on me, but we'll see. But I'd like to cover a couple chapters in the evening so we're not parked here in Genesis forever. But tonight is one of those uh, studies that I don't know how far we're going to get. And it does have application for us today. So uh, let's pray and we'll dive into our study this evening. Father, we thank you again for your word. You know, it is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. 
And Lord, we want to pray for your church tonight. I was just praying for the church universal today. Just, and then, Lord, my mind went to all the churches in our town. And I was just praying for them and for the pastors and the elders. Lord, that, that they would remain faithful to the study of your word. That if in any wise they have bought in to the lie of the enemy, that it's not authoritative and it's not meant to be taught expositionally, Lord, that they would come back to that central truth that your word is quick and is powerful, sharp. And your word is meant to be studied. It's not meant to be read. We're never commanded just to read. We're commanded to study. And it's important that we go through these things, even the Old Testament. And even tonight, when we come to chapter 6, some are going to say, what? Huh? Why? Well, we'll tell, you. we'll tell you what the why is of it. It's important. And so, Lord, just give us ears to hear tonight and hearts that are open. And we ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. When we come to chapter 6, there's huge controversy, you know, over what is going on and what is being said here. And so we're going to have to unpack this tonight. We're going to exeget it properly, and uh, we're going to come to the only conclusion that can be found there. So, hey, let's just read the first four verses, uh, kind of get the theme, and then we're going to see what is going on behind the scene here tonight in what is happening and uh, what God did to remedy it. And so, let's just read chapter 6 of Genesis, starting in verse 1. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, that the daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and note this, and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, and same became mighty men, which were the men of old, men of renown. There are two interpretations of this passage. The ones who want to take the easy way out and not properly exeget it say, well, there was the line of Seth, the righteous line of Seth. And the righteous line of Seth, as we went through chapter 5 when we followed out the lineage there, you see that it picks up the line of Seth and runs it through Noah. And some would say, well, that was the righteous line of Seth. And the righteous line of Seth began to intermarry with the unrighteous line of Cain and uh, because of the wickedness of Cain and the righteousness of Seth, they had these offspring that were maladjusted, to say the, bit, the, uh, to say the least. And, but, you know, the problem with that interpretation is nowhere do we find in the Scripture about the righteous line of Seth. In fact, if you trace Seth's line through Noah, when Noah got off of the ark, the first thing he does is build an altar and make a sacrifice because he's a sinner just like the rest of us. Although he was a righteous man, and we're going to see a few things about him, he still needed a Savior. He was still conceived in sin and born in transgression. So there is no righteous line of Seth. And how many have heard that explanation for this passage? How many even even read this passage and said, what is going on here? Yeah. Well, we're going to unpack it tonight, and I wanted to get all the way through chapter 8 tonight, but, you know, I don't know how far we're going to get with this. It's going to be an interesting study. And let me just share with you on the onset of this, at the fore of this, um, what I think and why I think that it's important that we study these things. You know, Paul tells us that everything that was written in the Old Testament were, was written for our learning and for our admonition to those who have come to the end of all ages. What Paul is saying is there are things in the Old Testament that will be extremely interesting and applicable to those that are alive when Christ returns. They have application there. And one of the things that we're seeing today, and before we get into this thing of the Nephthalim, how many have heard the word Nephthalim? How many have been watching Ancient Aliens on the Discovery Channel? 
And, uh, you know, all these weird things. Well, let me tell you what's going on and what we're going to unpack here this evening. You see, evolution is no longer a threat to Christianity. In 1954, when they developed the uh, electromagnetic uh, uh, telescope, I mean, uh, uh, microscope, where they could actually look in and study DNA, when they developed DNA, they understand that, as the Bible said in Genesis, each after its own kind. We know that every credible scientist, whether he be a believer or not, believes in intelligent design. He can't believe in anything else if he's going to be honest with the evidence. The DNA coding the genome, the six, billion, the six million bits of information that make you, you. Uh, so evolution has been set aside. We know there's not billions of years. We know there's, there's no way you can become anything but a man. A man can only produce a man. So now they're understanding, because of intelligent design, that Evolution is not a possible or plausible explanation for life. So now they're postulating this theory called panspermia. How many you heard of that? Panspermia. That we were placed here by aliens. You see, you're alien offspring. And have you seen the guy with the weird hairdo? Like, man, get a haircut. Have you seen the guy on Ancient Aliens? And he's always talking about ancient texts, this, you know, uh, uh, all of these ancient texts speaking of these guys. Well, listen, they go back to these texts that we're going to look at th this evening, and we're going to study, and we're going to see what they're really saying. And so if it wasn't the righteous line of Seth, if it wasn't, you know, righteous people intermarrying with unrighteous people producing this weird offspring, then what in the world is going on here? Well, when you look at the term, and circle this, if you will, with me in verse 2, sons of God, it, it only appears, this phrase, three other times in the Old Testament. It appears in Jude chapter 1, verse 6, and then again in Jude chapter 2, verse 1, and then again in Jude, I mean, excuse me, Job chapter 38, verse 7. So Job chapter 1, verse 6. Job chapter 2, verse 1, and Job chapter 38, verse 7. And in every one of those instances that it appears in the Old Testament, this phrase, it's always in a reference to angelic beings. It's clear if you properly exeget it that what is being spoken of here is angelic beings. That angelic beings saw that the daughters of men were pleasing to them, and they took them. We're going to break that apart in a few moments. And they had sex with them, and they produced these, these, this offspring of giants, men of renown. We're going to see why those angels did that in a moment, and again, the cure for it. But it's interesting, when you study through the Old Testament, you read about these men of renown. These giants. In fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 11, you might want to write this down. There's mentioned there are 60 cities of these giants. And uh, these are the six names that they go by. They're the Anakim. You remember when David went out to fight against Goliath, he was one of those who came from the line of, of Anakim. Uh, he was nine foot six, and he was short compared to to some of these guys. There's our, there are bone uh, and fossil uh, remains that we have today that some of these guys were as much as 12 feet tall. In fact, when you go through and you read about King Og of Bashan, when they finally killed him, they took his bed that was made of iron as a, as a trophy because he was over 14 feet tall. And so there's fossil evidence of these giants. In fact, Buffalo Bill Cody, when he was interacting with the Indians of the Plains, they brought out in one of his interactions this thigh bone of a human being, and when they measured it and examined it, it would have been to a man that would have been 12 feet tall, and the Indians say these men roamed the plains until finally God, the Great Spirit, because they were in rebellion against the Great Spirit, killed them all. And so there's evidence of these things, that the Anakim, the Avum, the Emum, the Horum, the Rephim, and the Zamzumim, these were the names of which they were called by. And so we know the Bible speaks of this. In fact, you know, Flavius Josephus, one of the historians of the early church, now he says this in, in book number one, chapter three. Let me read this to you just so that you'll understand that early church fathers 
believed that these were angels. Now, we have to establish that fact as we move on in exegeta to understand what's going on here. So Flavius Josephus, how many have heard of Josephus, the historian? Listen, he writes in his, uh, in his writings, The Ant- Antiquities of the Jews, in Book 1, Chapter 3. I had to dig this out today. He says, now, this posterity of Seth continued to esteem God as the Lord of the universe and have an entire regard to virtue for seven generations. So he's talking about the, what, would, what some believe would be the righteous line of Seth. He said, we agree with that for seven generations. But in process of time, they were perverted. So what he's doing is he's he's denouncing that these people, these giants, the Nephilim, came from the righteous line of Seth because in in time, after seven generations, they became perverted and forsook the practices of their forefathers and either paid honor to God, which uh, was appointed unto them, nor did they have any concern to do justice toward men, but were for some degree of zeal they formerly had shown for virtue, they had completely abandoned those things, and double degree of wickedness came upon them. So he is dismissing this being the line of sense. Then he says this, the very next paragraph, For many angels of God accompanied with women, and begat sons that proved unjust, despisers of all that was good, on the account of their confidence that they had in their own strength. For the tradition is that these men did what resembled the acts of those of the Grecians called demigods. So the myth, the Greek comes with these demigods, Hercules and stuff. We know that that myth has root in reality. That there were these men who walked the earth, these renowned men, these giants, uh, these offspring, as we're going to see. And then he has a footnote in his record here, Josephus does. And, and when you read the footnote, it says this. This notion that fallen angels were, in some sense, the fathers of the old giants was a constant opinion among those of, uh, of antiquity. And so when you look at the phrase in the scripture, this phrase, the sons of God, it appears three other times in this, in this context and in this setting in the Old Testament, in Job chapter 1 and in Job chapter 2 and in Job chapter 38, and every one of those is a reference to angels. Now we have a problem, don't we? Because in Matthew's gospel, you remember when the guy came to Jesus and said, there was a man who took a wife, and he died before bearing offspring. This man had seven brothers. And each one of those men, in succession, took her to be their wife and did not bear offspring. Each died, leaving her a widow, and each one married her till all seven had married her, and they all died, leaving her no offspring. Now, Jesus, when we get to heaven, whose wife will she be? And Jesus said, you do err, not understanding that when you get to heaven, you will be like the angels. You will be gender neutral. There won't be procreation. There won't be marriage and given in marriage. So the Bible seems to teach. Jesus seems to say that angels don't have the ability to procreate. So when we look at this passage, no wonder there's difficulty here. You know, we know that it's not from the righteous line of Seth because Seth, that's not a, an explanation for this at all. In fact, Flavius Josephus completely undoes that. We know from exegeting the scripture that the phrase always refers to angels. We also know when we study the New Testament that Jesus said that angels are gender neutral. They don't procreate. So what in the world is going on? Well, if you'll turn with me to Jude. I just want to read a verse here that makes complete sense when you, when you read this. And then we'll kind of dive into it this evening. Jude, it's just a single chapter. We're going to pick it up in verse 6. It explains this. Now get this. And the angels which kept not. Jude is talking about judgment that's coming upon the world. And he's using some references, things that you and I can fall into that will bring God's judgment. And so he's referencing the fallen angels, those 
that rebelled against God, no doubt following Lucifer, and were thrust out of heaven. And one day, you know, there's a, there's a reservation for them one day that will be in chains and outer darkness. And so Jude is going to give us some insight into that whole thing. He says this, And the angels which kept not their first estate, note that, but left their own habitation. That means there was something that changed. They kept not their first estate. Something changed. That angelic being was distorted and corrupted, maybe even somewhat metamorphosized when it left that place of glory. When we get to the book of Revelation and we see these demonic forces, these fallen angels coming up out of the pit, we see how distorted they look. They left their first estate, uh, their own habitation. It says, he hath reserved, there's a future time coming where they're going to be in chains and darkness under the great judgment. But then he says this in verse 7, get this. Even as they left their first estate and their habitation, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh and setting forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of the eternal fire. So what is Jude saying? These fallen angels, when they fell, were so distorted from their original state that they took on some kind of human form that could actually have a sexual relationship with the daughters of men and bear these weird, perverted offspring. And so if you look at the Scripture, as weird as it seems, and as weird as it sounds, and hard as it is to swallow, what the Scripture is simply saying is that the sons of men, the fallen angels... Those who kept not their first estate, those who left their habitation, those who rebelled against God and were thrust out of heaven, when they came to the earth, they took on a form because the Bible tells us that Satan, being an angel of light, can even, you know, he can even morph into, uh, 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 the, Satan, the angel of darkness, can even morph into an angel of light. He can transform himself into a minister of light. That's why we have to be careful that somehow they went through this change where they were able now, like in Sodom and Gomorrah, to, to enter into these sexual relationships and bear this offspring. And we're going to see why they did that in a few moments. But I think that, listen, as we're looking today and we're hearing more about UFOs, panspermia, alien visitation, you know, what would happen to many people's faith that don't study the Bible, that don't know what the Word of God says? What would happen to their faith if tomorrow a race of giants showed up and said we're from the planet Zog? And by the way, we planted you here billions of years ago. Could Satan bring that kind of deception? Because the Bible says lying signs and wonders in the last days. Yeah, I think he could. I think he might. And the Bible says they would be deceived because they love not the truth. You see, this is why this study is so important tonight. Because if before the rapture these guys showed up, we would know where they came from. We would know what they're about. And we know what God's going to do with them. Because it's right here in Genesis chapter 6 and in Genesis chapter 7. It won't be startling to us because we know from the scriptures that these fallen angels took on physical form. And, and get this, the sons of men saw. The word there for saw means to spy out. And so they were peeping toms. They saw that the daughters of men, that they were fair, that they were beautiful. There was something sensual about them. And they took them, the word there to take in the Hebrew, is the word to take by force. It has the sense of violence to it. They took them wives as they chose, as it was their will to do. And the Lord said, listen, my spirit will not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Now, some people say, well, that means that man here at this time is going to be limited to 120 years. That's not what it's saying. It says in 120 years, because of what's going on, I'm going to bring judgment upon the earth, and I'm going to wipe out flesh. We know that 
Noah was 500 years old when this account comes. We know that when the ark is finished, he will be 600 years old. We don't know how much change, but we know that it took him about 100 or 120 years to build the ark. Because God is saying what is going on is a perversion. What is going on is a deception. What is going on is going to try to disrupt what I'm going to do. Now we go back to Genesis chapter 3 and what was the promise to Adam and Eve when they fell? Especially to Eve. Through thy seed a Messiah will come. Correct? And he will crush the head of the serpent and bruise his heel in the process. That this one to come will be completely man with undiminished deity. He will come through a pure bloodline of Eve as you follow through Adam all the way through King David into the Messiah. There will be a lineage that we can trace, a perfect lineage, a perfect line. And the sacrifice that would come would have to be completely human because it has to be a perfect man. For one, by one man, follow me now, by one man, Adam, sin came into the world. Thus by one man, the Christ man, he will come and take sin out of the world. For Jesus to do the work of the Messiah, he would have to be 100% man with undiminished deity. Now, how can Satan spoil that plan? Pollute the gene pool. Pollute it to the extent where when the Messiah comes, he cannot come through a pure lineage to be 100% man with undiminished deity. How do you do that? Let the fallen angels come down and be with the daughters of men. And let them produce a race. And let the gene pool so be polluted. We'll see that in the text tonight. And so be polluted that the Messiah cannot come through a pure lineage. And thus, we can wreck the plan of God. That's what's before us this evening. And so when we read, and it came to pass, as it always does, when men began to multiply upon the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, the sons of God, these fallen angelic beings saw, they lusted after, they spied upon these daughters of men. And they saw that they were fair, they were attractive, that they were sensually drawn toward them, so they took them. And it's almost in, in kind of a forceful sense in the Hebrew to be their wives which they chose. And the Lord said, listen, I'm going to put an end to this. I understand what's going on here. My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh, yet his days shall be numbered 120 years. These were the giants, and that word giants in Hebrew circle it is the word nephtalim. Now, you're hearing a lot of that probably on Ancient Aliens and some of the programs today because they're saying that these Nephtalim were really aliens. And they are, in a sort. They're not human. Not completely. They come from a different realm, a different sphere. They're a principality. They come from somewhere out there. They're not benevolent, they're malevolent. They come with a purpose, they come to deceive. They come to corrupt. And the Bible get this as, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Do you think that we might be revisited with some of these things? I think so. What a deception. Evolution has been laid aside. It cannot be a scientific fact. It's been disproved by the genome, by DNA coding. We know that as science has finally caught up with the Bible, we understand in 1954 when they coded that and, and quantified it, they understood that, that, listen, what it takes to make you, you, and listen, it's, it's, a, it's an encoding. Man can only become a man. A dog can only become a dog. You can have variations of dogs. You can have German shepherds and wiener dogs, but they're all still dogs. You can have variations of pigeons, you can have variations of monkeys, but you, and you can have variations of men. Look around. But they're still men. And that rattled the scientific community because they understand from that that, listen, evolution is not a possibility. When they look closer, they found out the simple cell is not so simple as a motor, and every piece, thousands of pieces, all had to be in existence at the same time for it to function. They know that we were created. Now, some scientists will say, well, intelligent design, obviously. 
They won't make that next step that there's a creator that we do from Genesis chapter 1. So know this, that the deception of evolution is no longer plausible. It's no longer defendable. What next? How would you deceive mankind? How would you explain our existence? And for the last 10 years, as I've been tracking it, there's this whole idea of panspermia. Notice the movies that you've been seeing. Aliens. Now, we know that these men were 12 to 14 feet tall. Men of renown, mighty men, extraordinary men. Why do you think, follow the flow here as we work our way and exeget this passage, why do you think, because some of these, those 60 cities mentioned in Deuteronomy, were in the area of Cana, why do you think that God told his people, when you go over into the land that I'm going to give you, the land that flows with milk and honey, that I'm going to displace the Canaanites and all these other ites that are living there when I displace them. In fact, when you get over there, listen, you kill all of them. Why would you think God would say, kill all of them? I've had people say, well, man, the God of the Old Testament must not be the same God of the New Testament because when he told the Israelites to go into the promised land, he told them to wipe them all out. Why? Because that was a polluted race of wicked and violent men that it intermingled with fallen angels, and they were told to wipe out. And that's why he says, do not let your daughters marry those men of the Canaanites. Do not intermarry. There's a reason for it. Because you are a pure people. You are a peculiar people. You are a called out people. You're my people. And your lineage has to remain pure because the Messiah will come through the Jewish lineage. It has to remain pure. So as it was in the days of Noah, I wonder if the Bible is trying to tell us something, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Will we see again these fallen angels revisiting the daughters of men and producing the Nephthalim, these giants that were in the earth in those days? Now, notice that God wiped out all flesh except for Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. Only eight souls survived of the human race on that ark. But then it tells us that after that there were giants. So we know that the giants weren't wiped out during the flood. But yet they reappear. They reappear and try to pollute the gene pool. How could they reappear if all flesh but Noah, which we're going to see in a few moments, was righteous, how could they reappear if they were earthbound beings? They couldn't. But yet they reappear. Because the Bible says that they were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. When the sons of God came into the daughters of men and bare children to them, the same became the mighty men which were of old men of renown. And so the Bible is saying, the Bible is teaching when you exegete it properly, that it was these fallen angels that left their first estate, uh, that left their original habitation, the way that they lived, the way that they existed, and they took on some other form, and they corrupted themselves as Sodom and Gomorrah, in the same way Sodom and Gomorrah corrupted themselves in the lust of the flesh. So we can conclude from just working through the passage and understanding what it's saying that what is transpiring here is that these fallen angels are literally having a sexual relationship with the daughters of men and producing a polluted offspring. And we're going to see why in a few moments. Verse 5 says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination... And that's an interesting word in the Hebrew. Imagination means to have... Because you don't, you don't see with your eye. You know that, right? You know, your eye has the, is, has the longest nerve in your whole body. The optical nerve. And it runs there. And it has these rods that take in different kind of lights and information. And literally, that optical nerve transmits those things to the back of your brain. And literally, chemically, it's sprayed up on a screen. And you see with your mind. And if you don't think that's so, just close your eyes and try to visualize something. You can. You can literally play a movie in, the, in your mind with your eyes closed. That's the interesting thing about your brain. Everything that goes in through your eye gates is recorded. And it's never erased. 
That's why Job said, listen, I made a covenant with my eyes not to lust after the young ladies. Why? Because he knows that everything that goes into his eye gates is recorded upon his mind. It's chemically recorded. It's stored there. And the, in the most inconvenient moment, Satan can bring that back up and tempt you with it. So he said, I made a covenant with my eyes. I suggest you make a covenant with your ears as well. And don't listen to things you shouldn't listen to. Don't look at things you shouldn't look at. And what he's saying here, because of the wickedness, listen, he says, every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Uh, this wicked influence that came from the fallen angels and even from the fall of man had corrupted man. And it says in verse 6, and it repented the Lord. Not like we have to repent. You, you can circle that word in the Hebrew. It's more regret. It regretted the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping things and the fowls of the air, because it regretteth me that I ever made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Notice verse 9 carefully with me because it really brings home this thought of what we've been looking at. These are the generations of Noah. Isn't that interesting? He's going to talk about the lineage of Noah. Noah was a just man. I mean, he was a moral man. He was a godly man. He was a righteous man. He was a man, we're told, that feared the Lord. In fact, when you read in Hebrews chapter 11, don't turn there, let me read it to you. Hebrews 11, verse 7 says uh, of Noah, it says this, By faith Noah, being warned of God, the things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house by which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness, which is by faith. This is the kind of man he was. He was a man who believed God. He was a man who had a relationship with God. He was a righteous man. He was a godly man. He was a man who feared God. He moved with fear when God spoke to him, and for 120 years he banged away on this boat. Man, can you imagine the ridicule that comes from that? Can you imagine the job? You want me to do what? Yeah. We're going to get to dimensions, maybe not this week, but next week, 450 feet long. What? 75 feet wide, yeah. 45 feet tall. Made of gopher wood or, or cypress wood, pitched inside and out, making all of these rooms in it. Get, get going, boy. What? It's a good thing he had three sons. He probably told his three sons, you go find three wives. You find some strong women and you bring them back. We got a job to do. And the Bible says they would come down and ridicule Noah. What are you doing, Noah? I'm building an ark. Oh, what's an ark? It's a big boat. Well, what do you need one of those for? Well, water is going to fall from the sky. You see, it never rained before. For 40 days and 40 nights. And the big question is, how long can you tread water? Because God's going to judge the earth. And they mocked him and they laughed at him. Until the day that he went in the ark and God himself shut the door and it began to rain. People are mocking us today for our faith, but they'll turn on to ancient aliens. Or they'll read the book of Enoch. There's a reason why it didn't make it into the canonization of Scripture. Although there are some things recorded, I think that he's right. But watch this. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. Notice that phrase. Perfect. The word perfect means um, that he was unscathed, intact, without defect. That's the Hebrew word. Unscathed, intact, without defect. What is he saying? His gene pool was not polluted. Not only was he a righteous, God-fearing man, but his gene pool was unscathed, intact, without defect in his generations, in his lineage. 
So from the lineage of Noah, we could get a perfect man, the DNA of a perfect man, so that God could become a perfect man, conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of a virgin. It was necessary for redemption. Now God's going to destroy all other flesh because it wasn't unscathed, it wasn't intact, and it wasn't without defect. Because these fallen angels began to interbreed with the daughters of men to pollute the gene pool so you could not have a perfect man. A perfect as far as the gene pool goes so that the Messiah could become completely man with undiminished deity. Satan's first attempt we see here after the fall of the garden to thwart the plan of God. But Noah being a just man, perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Now, let me ask you, kind of resemble anything going on around here? As it was in the days of Noah? Are you kidding me? When you can... Turn on the news and see that a man, for no other reason than his own sexual pleasure, would kidnap several young girls and hold them in bondage and in chains and sexually abuse them repeatedly, forcing them to have abortions by beating them. You don't think we're living in a violent drive-by shootings? You know, I, <laughs> I hate to even turn on the news. Turn on the news this morning and this guy's being sentenced. It was a police officer in this town that, that, that shot his wife to death and burned her house down and left a, a suicide note. Now he's gone to prison for life and there's his children without parents. You, you can't turn on the news that you don't see violence. Violence like you didn't see in the 40s or in the 50s, I don't believe. This earth is becoming violent. It says the earth was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh, get this, had corrupted his way upon the earth. What's happening? This intermingling. It's corrupted. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Through what? Through this corruption of this mixed marriage. And behold, I will destroy them from the earth. Make thee an ark. Now, this is interesting. Circle the word ark because in Hebrew it can be translated two other ways. Chest. You remember the ark of the covenant was a chest. And the things that were in it were holy unto the Lord, the Ten Commandments, the rod of Aaron that budded, a jar of manna. On top of it was the mercy seat, the cherubim stretching over it. That was a chest that's called an ark. So it can also be interpreted chest. It can also be interpreted coffin. That's important. Uh, we may not get there this evening, but that's important, so just keep that. Make you an ark, so it's a box. Now, years ago, I just, for whatever reason, you know how you get these kind of little, like little hobby things going on, I really started studying because I believe that Noah's ark is on Mount Ararat. Uh, there are those photographs that come from satellites that the last two weeks in August depending on what kind of seasonal snowfall we have, that there's a glacier up there that recedes enough that you can actually see part of it sticking out. I believe that's Noah's Ark. There's, there is enough evidence of people visiting in it and bringing pieces of wood back from it to believe that it's there. When you read the scriptures, it says that Laden on the mountains of Ararat, and as the water receded, they saw the tips of the other mountains, so that it would indicate that it's high up, about the position where the satellites say it would be. I believe in the last days when these creatures begin to show up in this deception that I think that in a greater degree God will reveal Noah's Ark and the whole thing will be revealed. Oh yeah, yeah, we know who these guys are. We know the whole story of Noah. We know why the flood came. To destroy people like you. There's another judgment coming, this time by fire, to destroy men like you. So here's what he's saying. It's a box. So what I'm saying is, is when you go over there, there's some guys that have discovered this thing that looked like a, a ship, you know, had a bow in the front and a bow in the back, and they went out there with their um, magnetic sensor, radio, 
radar sensors and they've outlined it and they built a little thing. You can go there and you can look at it and they say, well, there's Noah's Ark. No, no, no. I know it's not Noah's Ark because it's shaped like a ship. This thing would be shaped like a barge. It's going to be a square box. And that would be for a flood. You can't navigate a square box very well. But for a flood situation, perfect structure. In fact, the ratio is six to one. We build battleships after that ratio too because they can handle the greatest of storms. In fact, it's been proven that this ark by its dimensions with height and, and, and length could, could stand up 90 degrees and right itself. You don't think God knows math. It could just stand, you know, man, you get one of the big waves coming, woof. Would that have not been a ride to have been in that ark? Hang on, baby, e-ticket ride. And then you got to take care of all the animals afterwards, shoveling that stuff up from their situation. But, but it was an ark made of gopher wood. Get this. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and you shall pitch it within and without with pitch. Why would you pitch it within? If you only wanted to waterproof it, wouldn't you just pitch it without? Every shipbuilder in ancient times, when they used pitch to seal the ship, only pitched the outside of it. They didn't pitch the inside. Who wants to lean up against pitch? How many of you ever leaned up against a tree and you get pitch on you? It's a horrible experience. You got to get out, uh, rubbing alcohol to get it. I just, it's, it smells nice, but it's sticky. And doesn't it seem the part that you touch and get pitch on you, you always touch it to something, your skin, your clothes, something. Why would you pitch the ark inside and out? There's only one reason I can think of. Think with me tonight. Put on your thinking caps when you come as we're studying through the Old Testament. To preserve it. To preserve it. That it would be there in the last days as a testimony. That's why you would pitch it inside and out. Verse 15, and this is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. The length of this ark shall be 300 cubits. Now, we can debate, you know, was it a cubit of a Nephtalim or was it a man's cubit? Was it a, you know, Hebrew cubit? He listen, if it was a Hebrew cubit, it means the boat was 450 feet long. If it's a Hebrew cubit, it means it's 75 feet wide and 45 feet tall. And I want you to see this. This is interesting. So it would be shaped like a coffin. Why? Because these men are going to go through Noah and his sons and their wives through the greatest baptismal experience ever. And they're going to come out the other side alive. When we baptize, what do we know that baptism is a representation or a symbol of? You going down into the water, the old man dying, and the new man raising afresh. I wonder it was shaped like a coffin. But get this, and a window shalt thou make to the ark, and it shall be a, a, a cubit shall thou finish it above. So just one window, just 18 inches square. And I find this interesting. Why? Because you're only to have one worldview. And what's that? God judges unrighteousness. And God saves the righteous. That's our worldview. There are many worldviews trying to be pressed into your mind and into the mind of your kids. But God has one worldview. And it's from that same window that he saw the dove come back with the olive branch. It's from that window he saw the wicked judged. It's from that window he watched as the unrighteous perished. It was from that window when he pulled back away from it that he looked around and he could see that the righteous were saved. One worldview. One window. And then he says this, get this, and the door, the door, it's in the definite article, which means a door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof, which is with lower, second, and third stories uh, thou shalt make. So this ark was three stories. There was three levels in it. Above the bottom two levels, you'll put how many doors? One. How many ways are there into salvation? One. I am the way. I am the what? Truth. 
and I am the life. Other places he said, listen, I am the only door. You must pass through me to enter. Anyone who passes into the sheepfold any other way is a thief and a robber. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. I'm the only door. There's one way. One door in. And so he set that door. And get this. Um, let me give you some dimensions. Because, you know, people have said, well, there's just no way. Come on. Do you really believe that God put all of the species in that boat? That boat wouldn't hold that many. Really? Anybody done the math? L let me give you some astounding things. This boat, this is interesting, this barge if you will, would have displaced 24,000 tons, which would have meant, and scientists have figured this out, would have meant that the draft of this boat would have been about 22 feet. With the amount of weight, with what it said it would have carried, and the weight of the wood, somehow they figured out that the draft of the boat would have, what, what, how deep was the highest mountain underwater? We'll get that next week. 22 feet. That's interesting. The boat would have never hit ground. Uh, secondly, the ratio is a one of six ratio, which means you could have stood up 90 degrees and it would have righted itself. It wouldn't have flipped over. Get this. This is the space inside of this boat. There's 1,400,000 cubic feet. How would you like to clean that, ladies? It's the equivalent of 522 boxcars. Now get this. There's only 18,000 species. And scientists know if you took two of each species, it would only take 150 boxcars to put every, every, two of every animal known to man today in, you know, to be contained. And yet this would have had 522, plenty enough to contain uh, uh, what's going on. And they say, well, you know, come on now, you've you got to be kidding me. Um, wh wh what would happen to these animals? Well, could not God make them go to sleep? I think I would have prayed for that. It's going to be a long journey. Uh, we only have a few shovels, you know, several buckets. I mean, there have been elephants. Have you ever seen elephant dung? I have. It's not a pretty sight. So the, the capacity of the ark would have been more than enough to put what God said needed to be put into it. Get this and well, just a few more verses and we'll quit. Maybe we can get done with chapter 6. And behold, I, even I, do bring this flood, God said, the flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein there's the breath of life from under heaven. Everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant. First time covenant's mentioned in the Bible right here. And it's a covenant of salvation because you're righteous. That when judgment comes, you will be in the safety of an ark. And every time we read when God brings judgment upon the wickedness of this world, the righteous are always saved out of it. This is the first time we see covenant. Covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and the sons' wives with thee. And everything living, all flesh, to of every sort shall bring into the ark. Now get this, and, and, and I want to make this point because when we get to chapter 7, you're going to say, well, there, there's, there's, there, there's a discrepancy here. Because in the end of chapter 6, he talks about them coming two by two. How many have seen the cartoons or seen the uh, dramatization of this where the two by two, you got Mr. and Mrs. Lion and Mr. and Mrs. Giraffe and Mr. You know, two by two. Well, there's two clean but seven unclean. We're going to see that in a few moments. So watch this, and, and this is the, the interesting part of it. It says, to every one of his sort, thou shalt bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. Thou shalt male, bring male and female of the fowls after their kind, of the cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing upon the earth after its kind. Two of every sort shall come unto thee. God's going to bring them to you, Noah, to keep them alive. What he's saying is there's going to have to be a male and a female, a pair, that's all he's saying. They're going to come by pairs in order to keep them alive because they're going to have to procreate after this. 
And take thou unto thee all the food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be food for thee and for them. Thus did Noah, I like this, according to all that God commanded him, so he did. Now, let's just end there and tie a knot. Because I think that's an extremely important verse. Verse 22. Judgment is coming. Man has become corrupted. Demonic forces have involved themselves to even try to corrupt the salvation of man. What is going on has so displeased the Spirit of God that He's going to destroy all flesh from the face of the earth. As we read in the New Testament that we know there's two judgments. There's a judgment of Noah, but there's another judgment. As the world under Noah perished in water, this world, this present world, is reserved for judgment of fire. Noah was warned. Have we been warned? Noah understood that there were demonic forces at work that God needed to deal with. Do we know that? You wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and a host of evil wickedness in high places. Spiritual warfare. Is God going to judge those things? Absolutely. Do we believe that His judgment is pending? Yes. Do we believe it's even at the door? Of course. Why? Because as it was in the days of Noah, married and giving marriage, we see the description, those things are going on today. I love what Billy Graham said. We had Franklin Graham as one of our speakers down at the Calvary Chapel Pastors Conference. Wonderful seeing Franklin, kind of picking up the mantle of his father. You know, he told us that that he's an implant, that he's a grafted-in Calvary guy. He said, because, you know, although he has to be Baptist because that's the organization that he belongs to, he says, I would rather be with you Calvary guys than anybody else. And he said, for this reason, your love of God's Word. That you're the, the last remnant of pastors who would dare teach the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation. You're not afraid of any of it. You'll exeget all of it. And you, know, and, and you can hear his father's voice in there when he said, and you'll exegete all of it, you know, kind of a thing. And so, because we're not afraid of it because it's the truth. We're even willing to tackle scriptures like this. Why? Because we know there's deception coming. There's spiritual activity happening. We're warned. The, the thing that we're warned about in Matthew 24, the very first thing we're warned about the last days is deception. And if 12-foot giants showed up with olive-shaped eyes and big heads long fingers and said we're from the planet Zog and by the way you're offspring you say uh -uh, uh uh we know where you're from and you were kicked out of that place and God's going to take care of you just like he took care of your forefathers we know who you are we know where you come from and we'll not be deceived because we're not transplanted here by the means of panspermia, we are the offspring and the sons of the living God who created us in His image and in His likeness. Why? Because in the beginning, God, Elohim, created everything. Even you guys. You just didn't keep your first estate. You, did, you left your habitation and you've corrupted yourself. And listen, by the way, Jude tells us where you're ending up. Chains of darkness forever. That's your future. But we'll not be deceived by it. We weren't deceived by evolution. We're not going to be deceived by panspermia. We know that God destroyed those in that day to keep a pure lineage to Christ. Completely, absolutely human with undiminished deity so that He could be the Savior of the world. And just like in the days of Noah, God has provided us an ark. Next week, we're going to see that God beckons them to come in the ark as though he were in there. And the Hebrew word indicates that. Come and, and have fellowship with me. I believe that God rode out the storm with them in the ark, just like he rode out the storm with the three Hebrew children in that fiery furnace, just like he'll ride out the storm with you and I. But here is, here is the application of all what we study tonight. Here's what it comes to. We need to be like righteous Noah. And what was righteous Noah like? Thus did Noah according 
to all that God commanded him, so he did. What is God saying to us today? Come out from the world and be separate. That's not the unclean thing. And I'll receive you as my sons and daughters and put my hand of blessing on you. Have nothing to do with this world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, have nothing to do with that. My sheep hear my voice and they follow no other. Listen, take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow Christ because it's going to mean something, and it means something now, but it's really going to mean something in the really near future. And be not deceived. Satan's first attempt after deceiving Eve to sin to destroy the plan of God was a demonic deception, and God judged it. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be the coming of the Son of Man. So shall it be in this generation. Violence covering the face of the earth. Demonic. The Bible, Paul said, seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Lying signs and wonders. We need to be very careful that we stay with the Word of God. It takes a whole Bible to make a whole Christian. And so as we look at that tonight, why is that there? Why is chapter 6 there for us to scratch our heads and say, what in the world? Paul said those things were written in the Old Testament were written for your learning and for your understanding who have come to the end of the age. So these things won't freak us out. Hey, if a flying saucer landed right in Washington, D.C., and these big dudes walked out, wouldn't rattle me a bit. Because in ancient ages, if this happened, it would shake all faiths of the earth. won't shake my faith. Dude, I know a Nephilim when I see one. Are you Nephilim? Are you Anakim? Are you Rephim? Are you Zamzuman? What tribe are you from? But I know where you come from. You're not going to fool me. I won't be deceived. Because my Bible already tells me about you. That's why we study the whole Bible. Amen? Because they're liable to land. Wouldn't that be cool? Chuck Missler does a wonderful job about this. In fact, on the 50-year anniversary of Roswell, he came there and he taught on where the Nephilim came from. Wonderful study. You can look it up online, Chuck Missler and the Nephilim. Just look it up. He just exposes the whole thing. Rattled those guys. They didn't really like it. They rented a convention center thing. He was really going to come down and, and really get with them. He really did get with them. And he said, you know, I'll tell you what these guys are. Here's who they are. And, and the evidence is replete, we know. So, Let's stand and let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this evening that just reveals these things to us. But more than that, it always ends. After you you lay things out to us, it always ends. It always ends with a challenge. And Noah did all that the Lord commanded him, so he did. Father, in these last days that we're living in, a time like the days that Noah lived in. I pray that we would be found as obedient as Noah was. That we would be men and women who are righteous and just, that love you, that honor you, that walk with you, that fear you, and when you speak, we are obedient. And that our worldview would be the same worldview that Noah had as he looked out that window and saw that God's word was true and altogether right. And the things that he promised about the judgment 120 years earlier came to pass. And that because he was faithful and obedient, he rode out that judgment in the safety of the ark where the presence of God dwelt. And may we be reminded today You know, there are men today, this king's way thing, Father, that so many pastors are getting involved in trying to marry Islam with Christianity. There's a lot of men, famous men, men that if we mention their names today, this congregation would know their names that have joined in that. And they've forgotten that on the ark there was only one door. There's one way. There's one truth. There's one Savior. Not many ways. 
Help us to stay on that narrow way, Father. I believe your coming is soon. You know what? Rain clouds are gathering. I can almost hear you say, come on in. Or come up here. So keep us faithful, we pray, in these last days we ask. In Jesus' name. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King. In what you hear, let it be a sweet, a very sweet sound in your ear. You know, Lord, tonight as we dismiss ourselves, we certainly pray for those of our fellowship that aren't here tonight that are homesick. You know, we pray for those that are called in that have that stomach flu, Lord. Again, we just ask that, you know, it would go smoothly, Lord, and they would heal quickly, especially the little children, Father. And Lord, we just pray that you would wake us up in these last days. Lord, if there's any at the sound of my voice, and, and we understand that there are a lot of people that tune in, that don't even go to this church, all over the country, that tune into our website and download and listen to our messages, Lord. And I, I would just pray, if they're listening, that, Lord, your church would wake up and understand we are living in the last days, a time of great deception and spiritual warfare. And for us to navigate through this correctly and safely, for us to come out of this thing unscathed, Lord, we must be those like Noah that fear you, Father, that obey you, that do all that you tell us to do, Lord, because your ways are right. And you're a benevolent dictator in that, Lord, your word is without contestation. But, Lord, you have our best interest at heart. Help us to be those, again, I pray, Father, in these last days that haven't fallen asleep. You tell us to watch, to be sober, to be vigilant, because you know not the day that your master returns. Lord, we ought to be those that are watching and waiting. We ought to be alerted to the dangers and the deceptions, Lord. So help us to be those people. And not only that, as we saw Sunday morning, be those who warn and teach others. We need to be warning people. You know, time is short. Jesus is coming soon. Don't be deceived. We need to be those who clearly communicate the gospel. So help us to be that, we pray. As we go from this place, we ask in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's sons and daughters would say, Amen. 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 God bless you. Hey, if you need special prayer, we'll be up here in the front to do that. If you need to have hands laid on you or anointed with oil, um, we'd be happy to do that for you. Other than that, you are just dismissed to fellowship.